friend of ours. Oh, yes, we've been doing this now. Thank you. Maybe we don't want to say the number. I've been in the business 17 years. All right, ladies and gentlemen, can we pay attention up here first? I know it's bananas are exciting. <laughs> You're not going to eat that now, are you? I don't know. Anyway, uh, we've got a gentleman who's been helping us in this class for a, a bunch of years, and his name is Chris Kyle. He is a producer, director, owner of a distribution company that does male pornography. Well, gay male pornography. Specifically gay. Specifically gay. <laughs> And you're in the little gay porn mecca of Sonoma County, so there's there's about four studios here in town as well. Is he coming in? Who is that? No. No. Why was he supposed to? Oh, I don't know. We got one of his phone calls by mistake, so I don't know. He maybe he's doing another class. I'll bet he is. Yes. Yes. Anyways, uh, we bring him to you today. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, most of his presentation is interactive with you in terms of questions, so uh, that's the way he likes to do it. And I can't remember, what were you, computer science major? What was your major? Marketing communications. And then you, it was here at SSU? I was doing a SRJC when I got into the business. Uh -huh. And I uh, was doing a lot of technology, and a buddy came along that worked in a mail room of Lucasfilm with a producer that was filming tons of straight guys jerking off. Can we make a product out of this? And an hour and a half later, we had a domain name <laughs> and a website up making money. So we, that's how we started, cutting somebody else's footage and putting it together. And uh, he was our first client doing the full e-commerce delivery of DVD and video on demand. And now it's history. No, it's, yeah. and, millions uh, and millions of dollars later. The uh, video that the group showed about the history of porn in the United States, it was kind of in the 80s, 90s. So, um, I came along Chris when has, internet hit, in, or porn hit internet, yeah. which was a very interesting. Has lived a lot of the history. Yes. VHS to DVD, that was fun too. <laughs> now DVD to phone. And he's married. I'm married. Living happily. Yeah. We've been together eight years. My partner, well, my husband, uh, works for the company as well. I'm an open book, so here's it goes. So, so I'm an open book. <laughs> Take an I open was, book. Let's I welcome was. him. So the reason I like questions is I hate public speaking, so it makes it easier. So if I start stuttering, raise your hand and ask some questions. I am a total open book. You can ask whatever you want. Dollar amounts, what I'm into, whatever. I also cuss a lot, so it happens in our industry. <laughs> Um, I was born in San Francisco and grew up here in Runner Park. I, uh, I'm 41. I've been in the business almost 18 years, um, and I have seen the evolution of porn from film to VHS to DVD and now fully digital 4K porn being streamed to televisions. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and now down to toys, play toys, other things. And this year I'm actually getting into politics because the state of California wants to change or regulate the porn industry. So I'll, I'll be passing out stuff on that too, especially people that are voting so that they can understand that there's a lot of commerce that's leaving California. <laughs> We're all herding up and moving to Nevada. So uh, yeah. So 18 years ago you heard part of it. I used to work for Lucasfilm in the mailroom and met another guy, his name was Jason. We started a company together. Uh, he was part of the company for a couple of years when we brought on our first producer. And then uh, he left, I bought him out. And we took the same business model that we were using with one producer and now we have 75. That we do basic marketing from, they give us their raw footage and we turn it into a product that can be sold in a retail store, an online site, digital streaming, satellite television. Uh, hotel video on demand. We kind of do a little bit of everything and turn it into a product uh, similar to even getting their models casted and turning into dildos and distributing. It says actual size. I haven't seen it in person. I don't know. But um, you guys are more than welcome to pass them. I brought industry magazines so people that want to flip through and see What's happening, apparently this is the year of the cock ring. 
So, uh, I don't know where that is, but there's a magazine in here that has a, it says the year of the cock ring on it, and all the companies have come out with these new fun toys, cock rings, and uh, cock cages, and all these fun, interesting toys. You guys were talking about Fifty Shades of Grey earlier. I've got a company that released Fifty Shades of Twink, which is a parody of Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, gray. But uh, Twinkie's a younger guy, no hair, fun, barely legal age. They're all my No questions. So, like I was saying, that. Runner Park is a gay, gay porn mecca. There's a studio here that, own, or there's a company here that owns about seven studios, and they work out of here, San Diego and Montreal. And then there's another company out of uh, Sonoma called Colt Studios that's been there 40 years. They're like one of the number two, one or two gay porn studios that started up in the San Francisco Bay Area 40 years ago. Uh, it's been a fun, fun ride for them. They're still around. Okay, sure. Uh, any talk from you guys? Yeah, anytime. Just raise your hand and hit me with a question. What is so, a cock cage? A cock cage? Yes. You've never seen a cock. Oh. Uh, so a cock cage is it actually has a lock on it. It's like a chastity belt for a guy. So your cock and balls are in it with a lock and your partner keeps the key to the lock. They usually wear it around their neck to show ownership of the other person in the BDSM world. Are you guys having them come in? Yes. Yeah. So you'll learn you'll learn a little bit more about the, the BDSM, the ownership and role playing. It's not my thing, but it's interesting. But King's got a lot of it on there. Like superheroes are really big right now. This one you get a comic book with. So there's an X-rated comic book as well as a DVD. They're fun. That's one of our best sellers. Oh. And then you guys were talking about Quiet, please. Getting, right, paid, guys. getting paid for porn. Here's a guy down in San Diego that shoots some porn of straight military guys. And it's, it's uh, straight military guys doing massage, having sex. It's, I'm not K, I just got bills to pay. This is the name of it, and that's exactly what he does. He pays them 1500 bucks to get jerked off. First time, first time guys. It's pretty good. We sell it for 40, sell like 600 copies. So the producer's happy. Some more parodies, Fast and Furious. It's the bears. I don't know, in the gay porn industry, there's bears. They're bigger guys, hairy, like kind of like me, but a little bit hairier. <coughs> Another parody and a 3D. We, you guys were talking about technology. He's getting into VR as well. So we have Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Balls. Another good seller. Thought it would be fun to bring it in. Silence of the Cams. It's like Silence of the Lambs, but they're killing live cam porn stars. It's fun. And then there was a reality TV show online called So You Think You Can Fuck. <laughs> Another thing, you watch an episode a week, you vote on it, and they eliminate actors and go through the whole thing. They've been doing it for six seasons. It's, it's kind of fun. They even follow the Real House Husbands of Miami. Another fun one. No questions? You guys are... Go ahead. Uh, do you just shoot gay porn? Or Actually, you, um, I, okay, so she asked if I just shoot gay porn. Yes, we, we, okay. we stay in the gay market. We actually, 85% uh, of our customer base is male, and uh, the other 15 are straight females that have the male-on-male -male fantasy that they want to fulfill. So we have a lot of the, it's similar in the straight world with the girls. They want to see the guy-on-guy -guy sort of thing, like the straight guys want to see. Um, so we do have straight women and couples that call in and get into the bisexual. We do, do s now sell bisexual and transgender porn, which has been slowly picking up in, the, in our, at least, they always point them to the gay, gay companies to get the transgender porn. So I'm not sure why, but we started carrying it. It's, it's, 
it's interesting to see a big beefy guy and then like, pull their pants off and they have a vagina. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Buck Angel is, is a big uh, transgender porn star right now. Right. Can you kind of explain how a day at your job go? Like, kind of, how do they? <laughs> would you? Uh, okay, well, I just, I'm curious, you know, because an exciting day would be filming or casting. Yeah. Meeting with people and, and getting to the. A lot of times, if you're going to do casting or you're going to shoot somebody, uh, it's it. It's not you come in, you strip down. You there's a lot of conversation that takes thing, place yeah. before, before you get them in the room, and a lot of times casting. We do, we'll set up a video camera in the room, and we'll have five people in that room, and if we're casting a guy, it's like, okay, whip your dick out, get it hard, and you have five people staring at you, and if they can't get it hard, they can't go on to the next part. Because when you get into a studio, you're gonna have more than five people watching you. You might have five people plus five PAs, and then personal assistants, and then, uh, you know, all the other actors and some of the guys are straight so their girlfriends are on set being there fluffing or whatever and it's it can be very interesting so we bring them in if they can last through the audition then they'll be moved on to like a scene with just one other person uh, we'll push them to their limits to see what they're interested in doing and then it's a sliding scale on pay they usually get paid for their audition to get a couple hundred bucks to jerk off They'll sign a release form, it will be used somewhere <coughs> if they climax. Um, other than that, it's it just goes up from there depending on price-wise. Uh, so the industry's definition for fluffing would be? Getting the guy hard. Or the girl. Some girls need fluffing but, uh, on the straight side. I've seen that happen. But it, uh, yeah, yeah, fluffing would be get a performer erect. Or aroused. A lot of performers use pills and injections. You know, Viagra is used a lot in the industry, or Cialis. Um, if you do watch a porno and you see a guy bright red and he's not really a pale person, it sees on Viagra. It's, it gets your blood pumping and you just turn red. Oh, some guys do. But uh, yeah, so so after casting, if we were to do an actual shoot, they're long. There are a lot of, I, I usually pass that on to a photographer and let them do it because it could take two days to shoot a five scene video depending on what actors you're using and how diva ish they are, you know. And so there's a lot, and a lot of them don't know what they're doing until they get there. So there'll be conflicts of interest like somebody won't bottom, somebody that only wants to top or they're only oral and they try to match them up, but when you get them on set, it all changes. And so things are not always planned out as best as possible. The, these parodies take the longest because they're trying to do a storyline. And uh, of course, all of, all of the actors are not the best at acting. Sex, yeah, they can be great at, but actually delivering dialogue is a different, <laughs> different piece. So you don't always get what you want on the, the, the parody side of things. Go ahead. Super in a bush, like you've been in the industry for a while. Have you ever considered like being an actor? Uh, she asked if I, I've been in the industry a lot. Have I ever considered being an actor? I have not performed in front of the camera. <laughs> I have done a live cam web show uh, with actors where I got naked, but I didn't. I wasn't part of the show. It was more I was facilitating it, and they they talked me into getting naked on cam. So <laughs> it helped them uh, with their anxiety. So. But other than that, no, I haven't, I haven't, I, I don't know, I have nothing against everybody that does it. Uh, of course, I'm selling it all the time, but uh, it's just not my thing. I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a marketing computer guy, you know, you throw a handful of pictures in front of me and a name of the title and we come up with things like Mr. Good Twink, you know, play off the, the candy bar and, and like we did the box artwork for this. So it's something that we, that we do as a company. Um, but when it comes down to the actual physical sex part, it's, that's not my thing. No questions. Go ahead. What's the craziest experience that you've had? The craziest experience I had was in the second year I was at a gay porn awards uh, in Los Angeles. And it was the first time I'd been to an event where a silver tray of drugs walked by. And I was just like, Okay, wow, so it is like, you know, everybody thinks some of the porn, it was a private party, it wasn't a big, you know, like public thing, but they had party favors walking around the room and I, 
called my best friend. Oh my God, there's drugs everywhere. <laughs> but it was, it was the, what, 98? So it was just one of those things that, that surprised me that it was actually <laughs> like, like that. Um, Naked Sushi was fun. Was, I did that in Vegas with the, had all the porn stars lined up with sushi on them and that, I thought that was pretty crazy. Seeing your favorite porn star with, you know, raw fish <laughs> on them. <laughs> Um, other than that, in the sex scenes, craziest is fisting. Uh, scat is really, uh, that's poop, if you guys don't know. I, we don't sell scat. I won't sell scat or blood because you can't ship it anywhere. But it's just, I don't get that fascination. So it just doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. And we get people that ask for it all the time, but I just find it really crazy to see, uh, what is it, Belgium chocolate. You should Google Belgium chocolate and sex. It's not fun. <laughs> uh, you probably are not gonna be able to answer this, but I have a buddy in uh, the industry, goes by the alias Jeremy Austin. Have you ever worked with? Jeremy Austin, no, I have to see a picture. I don't know him off the top of my head. I'll Google him later and see, yeah. But I don't know him off the top of my head. We see a lot of, a lot of porn stars come by. So there's a couple things that are happening in the state of California. Uh, there's Proposition 60. Have you guys talked about it at all in here? No. no? So Proposition 60 started out as uh, ballot measure B in LA from the AIDS Health Foundation of Los Angeles. Started this whole anti-porn initiative where not only do they want the actors to use condoms, but they also want to go one step further and make them wear goggles for facial cum shots. <laughs> condoms for oral sex, fancy dumbs, all these different, and it just goes down the list. It's for blood pathogens. Yes, there's been cases of HIV and AIDS in the industry, but the whole industry shuts down when that happens. Everybody gets tex uh, tested. They run a hiatus until everybody's clear. The people that are infected are pulled out. New people come in. But a lot of time, like when we film, everybody's tested before the filming. We ask them not to have sex, but if they're having sex between the time that they test and the time that they have sex for us, there's a huge window there. And the tests aren't accurate anyways. So if they get tested a week before, that only goes back 30 days. So anything from the day of the test back 30 days is still an open check. So it, we do what we can, at least in the gay porn side. We haven't had any outbreaks that I know of in my 17 years. But they're coming down one step further in this law. This law opens up the information, the private information of every actor and actress that's produced in a film in California. So what'll happen is this law, if passed, allows a consumer to sue everybody in the food chain if they found that that particular video was offensive. So if you watched a video and you found it offensive that she did anal sex bareback without a condom, you can sue that actor the person that made the video, the retail store you bought it at, and the website that's streaming it if you watch it online. So there's a lot of open privacy information. Is offensive defined? Not that I'm aware of. She asked if defensive was defined. It just says offensive. <coughs> it, it, so what if everybody just essentially that as a way to make easy money claiming that a video is offensive to them? Well, that's, that's the concern, is if yeah. this law passes and you get one, one case of this, and it changes the whole industry because people are gonna be suing people, courts are gonna be filled up with lawsuits and everything else. It's not a fun, fun thing for the porn industry. So everybody's moving out of California that produces porn. A lot of the gay porn companies, although they're based here in California, are shooting everything in Vegas because they don't want this to happen here. So they would file a civil suit so their purpose would be to obtain damages. Right. How do they prove damages? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. It started with Measure B in Los Angeles County, and it was a, uh, uh, it was for safer sex. But the the little you know everybody added a little piece to the law that made it a little bit more. And in LA, Los Angeles County, all the porn companies used to pull permits. They knew who was filming and where and. You know, they went from having 400 and some odd permits a month or a week, I think it's a week, that were pulled down to four. Yeah. 
So Los Angeles County is now not making any money. If all the revenue is leaving the state of California, the state of California is going to get a big hit in the next year and a half here with all the revenue going over to uh, Nevada. Has anyone ever been able to identify the tax base that was lost by this uh, flood of the... They're trying. Oh, it hasn't oh, worked. Okay. It hasn't yet, but they're trying. But all I ask is if you want to, if, even if you're not a huge fan of pornography, do your research, read about it. I ask that you vote no so I can keep stay in California. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be moving to Nevada. <laughs> because I'm a distributor and I'm one of the steps in the line that can be sued, that I'm open to um, liable. Is this just directed towards porn? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you read it, it isn't. But the, the, the industry is taking it full force as directed just to the porn industry. So, Go ahead. That means that if a TV show offends me, I can sue? Oh, you guys showed that uh, the one TV show that had simulated well, or real oral sex. Mm -hmm. the, if they had real sex or what looks like real sex, they have to have 2257 records. So there should have been a statement at the beginning of the show that said this show is certified 2257, all the records of the people, the actors that are in it, all their, I, I, we have files and files of driver's license and passports of every actor that's in every film that we distribute. And we call the DMV and make sure it's a real driver's license and verify the information. So when they do sex on real TV, they have to do that too. There's a movie called Short Bus that was an independent film about reaching your climax. And they actually had real sex in it. The director did real sex. And we saw a screening of it, and I was like, it's illegal. You don't have your 2257. And his attorney was there. And before it was released, they did that. They put a 2257. I don't know how it got an NC-17 rating, but they got a NC-17 rating with some real hardcore sex going on in it. It's a good movie. I suggest you guys watch it. So how are you um, finding your actors or reading or? So she, she asked me, how, how do we find our actors? A lot of them come to us. They'll be on a website that they like or they think they can do it. So they'll, they'll click on the, I want to be a porn star and they'll come to us. But uh, that's actually how I found out about this class. We advertised in the paper here on campus 15 years ago, threw in a little ruckus. And uh, that's when uh, we got our first class and <laughs> came in and started talking about it. But local papers, we'll do casting calls, open casting calls, and have people come in. And uh, the agencies that we work with do porn and they do mainstream placements. So they'll do a generic casting, and then during the interview, they'll also sort people to see if they'd be interested in taking that step of doing nudity and going further. So it's uh, do that Craigslist, social networking websites. If, if a producer finds a model that they feel fits with what they're filming, they'll usually just ask them, hey, have you ever done porn? Have you ever thought about doing porn? <coughs> and then they'll give them an offer or ask how much, how much it'll take them to do it. That happens. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm kind of curious because I've always heard the rumors about Renner Park being like this gay porn capital. Which like exact studios are based here? Uh, here is uh, if any of you guys know the gay porn Active Duty, uh, Next Door Studios, <coughs> Next Door Mail, Next Door Buddies, um, Falcon Studios used to be here in town. I know that Next Door filmed some stuff for them. Uh, Colt Studios. And what did they, oh, Pride Studios and Men Over 30 is another website that's here in town. They they're all look like they're based out of other areas. They do a ton of filming here and outside of Runner Park, but yeah. those are the main guys. Their guy hits all the gyms here in town to recruit. Um, what kind of questions do you ask in casting? Uh, questions that we ask in casting. Uh, well, we ask them if they have a partner. And what I, we got right down to it. 
Does your partner know you're here casting? Is your partner interested in being part of it? Uh, you know, what happens if your parents find out? Because we get panic calls. Oh my God, my, my mom found out. Can you remove my scene? Uh, no, sorry, it's already on DVD. It's half around the world. We could turn it off online, but we also come back and calculate what revenue we're gonna lose. This is what'll cost you to have it removed now that it's out there. So that's um, age, where they grew up, their sexual habits, how often do they jerk off, uh, what turns them on, um, and it helps build what kind of scene that you're gonna put them in, that sort of thing. Have they ever done it before? What stage names have they used so that we can look them up? One of your, I'm sorry, oh. I'm just gonna ask, one of your discoveries was Turk Mason. Yeah, Turk Mason. Or you, no. If you don't think he'd mind, tell a little bit about his story about how he got into it. And he started out uh, young. He was 18, 19. He was doing, um, he's from Sonoma, Sonoma County, grew up in Sonoma, and he started with mainstream advertising, actually. He was a, a Gap kid uh, and did some ads in magazines and just happened to be in the right place at the right time when we met him. And he's like, oh yeah, my, my boyfriend and I will do this. And brought him in and he did it for like 10 years, made a fortune. And now he's the uh, marketing director of Naked Sword out of San Francisco, uh, which is part of the Falcon Studio Group. So he's doing all their uh, affiliate marketing, banners, artwork creation. He's also the editor of Gloss Magazine. Uh, out of San Francisco as well. But he got so, out of performing. He got out of performing. He's now casting. So he's doing a lot of placements of go-go boys and or guys in the city. And he's got a core group of people that he casts out to other companies now. How, why did he get out? Did he just get tired? I mean, he was at the top of his game making money. Did he, I don't know. He felt he, that he got too old. He's a really young looking person. And now that he's mid thirties, he feels that he's too old to still fit that twinky role that he was playing before. Now he's more of a jock, hairless sort of guy, but he just got bored, bored of it. It was funny when he started working behind the scenes because he sent me a picture of his first paycheck and he goes, look, I didn't have to suck dick to get a paycheck. <laughs> and I, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> Him and I keep in touch a lot. He's in the city pretty busy now doing, doing the artwork. What did like, your family think of about you in the industry? That's a good question. She wants to know what my, my family thinks. Uh, my dad works for the company. Uh, he's our handyman. He comes into our warehouse and helps us organize things. Uh, in exchange, I fix his computer every time he breaks it. Uh, my mom does our accounting. Uh, my parents are totally cool with it. Uh, they're, my parents are, are hippies from the 60s. And they're like, hey, it's cool if it's legal. That's, that's all they said. It's, it's cool if it's legal. Oh, and it's paying for your house and your car. And, eh, that's fine. So it, we're an open book family. They came in. Um, my dad is very into photography. So he's, anytime we're doing a shoot, he likes to come out. And it's gay porn, and it's, I'm always uncomfortable. I got an old man next to me, and he's a straight guy <laughs> watching gay porn being filmed because he finds it fascinating. So it's, it's he's, yeah, he, he always loves coming in and interacting with people. My mom, I don't think she really cares. She just does numbers. She doesn't come into the office as much, but uh, she mostly works remotely. But the rest of my family, I have a sister. She thinks it's cool. No, no complaints. My partner did porn. Uh, before I met him, we didn't actually, I didn't know he had done it until later. But uh, it's, it's no big deal. It's porn. I mean, they're having sex. That's everything we do, but it's on screen. I mean, it's not that big. Good. Uh, how real are those like straight for pay videos where they like, find a random guy on the street or whatever? Oh, like bait buddies. <clears throat> bait buddies or bait bus. You know, I think some of it's pretty real. So some of the guys you meet later, they're one hit wonders is what they call them. If they pick up a straight guy, do a film, you usually don't see them later. But there was a, a guy in the industry, um, oh, Tommy D, he was from Runner Park. And he's a construction worker that got into porn and did like two scenes and exploded in the industry. Everybody wanted to use him. His girlfriend was like, well, that's kind of weird, you know, that you just went to jerk off and now everybody wants to use you in the porn. So he slowly progressed in doing more of the gay 
pay sex. And eventually, like him taking it up the ass was his $20,000 scene. Like he did one scene for one website the first time he had ever taken it, uh, bottom for somebody and got paid 20 grand for a 10 minute scene. I was like, damn. That was, two, that was like three years after he started. And then ever since then, he started his own website, Tommy D Triple X. And he's still, straight. he's still straight. He's married to that same girl. They have a family. He's now a foreman up in Seattle. Uh, he's doing contracting full time. He's probably 40 now. Yeah, I think he's about 40. So, but he's, he's done. He got out in this. He loved doing it when he did it. And now he's doing the family thing. So I still keep in contact with him. We're friends on Facebook. Facebook keeps everybody in touch. Come on, more questions. Yes, way in the back. Um, what is your opinion on like how it's affecting like children growing up now, like being porn being just like out of the internet? So she was asking me what uh, what how I feel about how porn is affecting children. I think it's desensitizing them. You can see it on both sides as as a business the way porn has been delivered to the consumer via the internet where it's so free, it's desensitized all the consumers of actually knowing what they want when it comes to sexual contact. And as children, I, I don't know, how many of you guys were under 10 when you saw somebody naked? Or saw sex, let's say sex, when you're under 10? Really? Okay, so let's say 15, or around the age of 15. So all of us, pretty much high school, right? You got into it. Well, now kids are, it's like sixth grade. So uh, the, the last stat that I saw, that it's elementary school that kids are getting on the internet and they're finding out things that they probably shouldn't know about until they're in their teens, like anal sex and blowjobs and things like that. That's what they're Googling. So if you do have kids, get them an adult or set up their <laughs> adult restrictions, which we use on all of our stuff. We don't want. We have uh, Surfing Nanny and a few cyber, cyber Nanny and a few other agencies where our site's blocked because we don't want underage kids on our site. There was a few other questions, yes? Um, what's salary like? Salary for me or salary? For both. Okay, so salary for me, I, I, I own the business. I take home 50 grand a year. I know it's not big. The business itself, our sales are about Three and a half million. We do about three and a half million in sales a year, and that's across the board on hard goods, DVDs, video on demand, uh, live chat sites that we uh, we get our actors to do live ca uh, cam shows to promote the videos, and then we get a. You guys were talking about it. We all share our traffic on the internet, so. If you found one particular model that you really like, and this is what our customers do, we send them to their website and we get 50% of the revenue. So a lot of that revenue, about 35% about of our revenue is just referring our customers to other sites. And we do nothing, we do nothing for it. We get checks, $1,000 for a week for our live cam website. That All we have is a button that says live cam. How, uh, what's your biggest expense? My biggest expense is the warehouse oh. right now. The servers used to be, bandwidth used to be our biggest expense, but now bandwidth is it's so cheap. Well, then that's changed because it was legal was your biggest expense there for a while. Well, legal starting to pick back up now. So when George Bush was in office, <laughs> legal picked up a lot for us. That, that was when we were doing a lot of legal. Uh, George Bush allowed uh, Visa and MasterCard to attack the porn industry in a way where in order for me to accept Visa and MasterCard, I have to pay five grand a year to Visa as a non-refundable deposit to secure our account. And MasterCard's 500 a year. And there's just no way around it. It's because they consider us high risk. But I've been doing this 20 years, high risk companies are ones with tons of chargebacks. We've had 20 years five chargebacks <laughs> and they still won't forgive the deposit. So we end up, that's right now it's like six grand a year we pay just to take credit cards. It's, it's stupid, but George Bush allowed that to happen, the deregulation and stuff. <coughs> There's your cock cage. Yeah, you want me to pass this around? Yeah, the question was so cock cages. <laughs>
the other side. Other questions? <coughs> oh, salaries for my employees. So shipping, receiving, they make about 30 grand a year with benefits. Uh, I have three salespeople. So our company's pretty small. Well, there's, there's five of us if I don't include my parents. So my partner, myself, two salespeople, a shipping clerk here in town, and then I have an IT guy that works out of Fresno, a graphic artist that works out of the UK, and a couple producers that are in Eastern Europe that send us content. Um, and those guys are all on our payroll. But like my artists work per job, but everybody here is salaried. They make between 28 and 35,000 a year with benefits. Company lunch twice a month. <laughs> if a good movie comes out, we all go see it. Um, <laughs> close the office. There's a new movie coming out about the gay porn industry called Cobra Killer. Um, it's gonna be full released by the end of the month. It's about uh, Brent Corrigan and uh, Cobra Video, which I brought a couple of the videos. Uh, so the producer was murdered after, a, it, so there's a gentleman named Brent Corrigan who did a whole bunch of scenes and the, him and the producer decided that uh, they were gonna part, well he decided he was gonna part ways because he could make more money being in other studios, but he had signed an ex exclusive agreement. And in the exclusive agreement, he said he couldn't use the name anywhere else. So if he wanted to use that stage name again, he'd have to change it or pay the, the other producer. There's another company that came along called Boy Batter that really wanted to use Brant Corrigan and apparently <laughs> they killed the other producer so that he could use his name. Um, yeah, it's uh, James Franco is playing one of the psycho killers in the movie. I just saw it about a week ago at Castro Street Theater. It's pretty good. It's an interesting drama. Yeah, it's an interest. It's pretty true. We distributed Boy Batter's films, so they portray that those two producers pretty pretty well. They were like Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, talking to him on the phone. So multiple personalities. They had it down pretty well. But that was probably the scariest thing that ever happened in the industry because Brent Corrigan during that time doctored his driver's license and he was underage. Oh. So it was my first experience of dealing with kiddie porn in the industry. I still have boxes of his videos that were underage taped up in our warehouse because we can't do anything with them. I can't throw them out. I, can't, I need to destroy them is what needs to happen. I was so going to say, is it not against the law to even have possession of them? Well, it was until the whole case thing was over. They had to prove it all. And then we had to get uh, credit for all the videos and you know because we bought them. And then you had to destroy them. And then we destroyed the videos. Yeah. I had the cases, the covers. Because it's kitty porn. Yeah, yeah. it's kitty porn. Come on, guys. Go ahead. Do you see yourself like, in the, this industry for the rest of your life? No, actually. Where do you see, do you see yourself going? Um, I think in the next five years, I, well, my, my husband and I are planning to have kids, and I'd actually like to exit the industry before I have kids. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I could still run it, but I, I see Mark going back into marketing communications, going back into maybe just the tech side of things, e-commerce. I do a lot of, we do third-party e-commerce set up for mainstream places as well. So I'm working on a, a website for a dispensary right now. So we're, you know, reaching out, trying to uh, try different things. Anyone else want to see what a, a cage looks like? Cock cage? Yeah. No? No. Okay. But I have a great picture of them. <laughs> Actually, this is probably the most exotic one I've ever seen. They're not cheap <laughs> Just either. polished uh, yeah. glass and whatever. Some of them are, are plated 24 karat gold. And, yeah, there's some pretty, pretty intense. But so do they make your partner wear that like a good portion of the day or like? Uh, usually it's during events like Folsom Street Fair when they're parading around on public or a bar. If they're going to go out and cruise, they'll have them put it on and they'll wear it pretty much all day. Like a trust thing? Uh, it's show ownership. It's a domination thing. It's a P BDSM yes. thing. Yes. Yeah, it'll be, it'd go into the BDSM side of things. A submissive would wear it. So, oh yeah, so only one of them would wear it. Yeah, the sub would wear the, the cock cage and the dominant one would wear a, uh, the key around his neck. Or they'd have a leash. Sometimes you see a collar and a leash. Uh, and they may not be wearing a cock cage, but it, they'll, they'll be doing the sub 
sub dom like that as well. And it's part of that submissive dominant thing where <clears throat> the sub wears it and then they engage in sex. And it prevents the sub from getting an erection, which causes its own pain. Or it'll hurt, yeah. Yeah. You get an erection in one of those, it'll hurt. Looks like you're ready to make a new stress ball. Yeah, oh, this? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's anxiety. It's the anxiety. I usually I have the, the, the flesh jacket. I'm fingering it the whole time. So I'm just like... <laughs> oh, come on, you guys. Go for it. Um, Whatever comes to mind. Yeah, just with you being, you know, that being your career and stuff, is it hard sometimes to go back to, like, reality in a way and, like, not think about how you want, like, when you're amongst people in your day-to-day -day life, like, not think of how you want to put them in a porn or, like, are you constantly having that on your mind? In the is beginning, yes. In the beginning, I used to do that all the time. You'd walk in, uh, Teresa used to tell a great story. You, we'd walk into, like, Costco and there's all these great looking guys working and it's like we're just waiting for their clothes to come off and a porno to start in the Costco and then you're like okay we're at Costco it's not going to happen here it's, but it, it, that used to happen more times than not yeah. uh, now it's become so day to day that it's just like another job yeah. the only the only thing that I could see being a huge issue for me is censoring what I say because I use dick at I mean I'm not like, even on the phone when we talk to customers, oh yeah, he takes it up the ass, he does a double penetration, it comes in his mouth and, you know, talk about cream pies and I can just see being somewhere, oh yeah, they cream pie last night, you know, it's like, yeah. A little bit how, was that, how was that gangbang last night? You know, like, <laughs> Teresa uh, used to be uh, Chris's major doll. I mean, she was his administrative whip and yeah. a cute gal with a bubbly personality. She was probably all oh, what five foot two or Four, three, three. three. <laughs> three. and uh, madly in love, uh, straight, uh, got married, um, and she said the first thing I do when I go into work is start going through all the pornos and I look at cocks all day long, <laughs> every day. <laughs> she said it a lot funnier than I did, but it, to see her say it was funny. It is. Every day, it's fun. Uh, opening up our mail is fun. All these different dicks and cocks and guys that come through. We, so we, we have a retail side too. So we have 70 exclusive studios that we, we do marketing, all their delivery of the distribution, and then we carry everything else on our retail website. So we get a chance to see what everybody's doing in the industry. And sometimes it just can be overwhelming. Like My, my partner and I will take breaks <laughs> we go to a hot springs where there's no internet or cell phone <laughs> just to get away from computers and technology and shut it down. And I go insane So while we're there because there's no technology. I can't get online. How are sales doing? <laughs> Nothing like that. Good. Does it like working in the industry change your personal sex life because like you're surrounded by like so much like intense different like... It did my dating life before I got together. Um, uh, with Joe, who's my partner, uh, husband. We, when I first started dating when I was single, I used to brag about being in porn. And then when I started dating people, it was like, oh, well, what porno can you get, in, get me into? And, you know, can I meet these guys? And it's like, okay. So the focus went from us dating and having a relationship to them wanting dick or free porn. And so I stopped telling everybody. And the, that's how I met Joe uh, eight years ago. We met online, chatted, never ever. We dated for three months before I said what we did. And that happened to happen. It was in a conversation. He happened to know somebody in the industry. And I thought, that's really weird. How do you know that person? And he came out, oh, I did a video for Falcon Studios, you know, when I was 18. And I was like, oh, OK. I had no idea. We, we, and so. I Googled him and found out all the stuff he did, and then he Googled me and found out all the stuff that I've uh, into on our on our end business wise. So, and then from there, it hasn't been a big deal. Uh, I don't think it doesn't turn me on anymore watching porn. I, I'm a physical person, so maybe watching it with my partner it would turn me on. But I, I it's such a fantasy side of what sex really is for me that. It doesn't, it doesn't trigger. It, I watch the more extreme stuff that's coming out. You know, we, we have the newest fetish coming down 
from our customers is guys in diapers having sex. <laughs> have no idea why that would turn somebody on, but we started looking for it and watching it, and it's like, Duck. it's kind of like, okay, whatever. If it sells, we'll have somebody start working on it, but it's not my thing. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, same with water sports. Don't get it, but people like to pee on each other when they're having sex, so okay. If they get off on it, great, but it's not my thing. I'm a vanilla person when it comes to sex. So. Anyway, anyone here not know what water sports is? Raise your hand. Anybody? Good. Golden showers keep you hard for eight long hours, or yeah, eight long hours or something like that. Yes. Yeah. All night long. Who knows? So Joe's in the business with you. Joe is our product manager now. So he does no, no, no more performing. Um, he works on our retail website, uh, choosing the titles that will be promoted on video on demand and uh, hard goods. And he also is doing a lot of our social networking stuff now. So learning, learning what you can and cannot post to Facebook or Instagram and Twitter, all the fun, fun things. We get kicked off all the time. So it's, oh, there's a little too much ass in that photo. Somebody. Found it offensive, so our account's locked for 10 days. We start all over. Tell us a little bit about Google. Google, oh, they're fun. Uh, Google, we have a large problem in Europe right now. That's why I found the stats fascinating, because Google, uh, there's a law passed in the UK that filters our content out. The UK finds our content uh, offensive. So I get notices from uh, Google UK all the time saying, oh, we had to pull this page out of our listing and this one out of the database. And so they're, they, they're going towards a pay model where if you want to be ranked higher in more explicit areas, you pay to be up higher. Um, it used to not be like that. They would just index everything and you type in gay sex DVD and there we were. Uh, but now they want you to kind of pay for it. And they're filtering, filtering based on age. So uh, a lot of kids now have Google accounts with their phones, and the parents can set what their age group is, and we're, our stuff's pulled right out of that. I, uh, but, but they divert traffic. They'll find your competitor and send them to them instead of us. Oh yeah, they're, they're getting paid. Yeah, totally. And how about their tracking? Tell the horror story about the Google account tracking for the user. The Google. I haven't had any horror stories on that. I mean, well, you, I mean, you're, you're the one I heard it from about if you if you enjoyed, remember when they came out and you had to sign up for a Google Chrome account, that they were then tracking every oh they do that anyway thing that you oh visited. on our on our end as a site <coughs> you can see all the data. So if you use Google Chrome or your phone and you've ever filled out a survey with Google, we see everything. We can we know that guys that are. 32 to 58 surf our website, and where they're geographically located, uh, and their income. I mean, I don't know how Google cross-checks all of it, but we get an, a massive amount of data on the users that come on our website. Um, and it's available whenever. I can see it live right now, of how many people, what sex they are, where they're from, what software they're using, what mobile device, if it's an iPad or a Windows pad, or whatever, how long they've been on the site, how much data they've downloaded, what network they're on. So if they're on Comcast or AT&T or a cell phone, I see all that data. It's very scary on yes. the back end. And you can pick a customer. That's the other thing is you can go back. If they made a, a purchase with us, it tags all their data in our statistics. So once we know who they are, and I can go back and see how much they've spent on other websites. So if I know a specific customer's information, I can go back into Google Analytics and see, okay, look, they spend so much at Amazon and they spend so much here. Oh, and look at all these other gay porn websites they're spending money on. So you can, you can see it. It's fun. How many people in the room knew that their accounts were being statistically traced like that? How many? You can turn it all off, too. Scary. You can turn it all off? Yeah. It's in the setting, it, you, it's buried in preferences. Google account? Yeah, in your Gmail or Google account. Yeah. It's a Sonoma is Gmail, everybody just so you know. Sonoma okay. dot edu. Sonoma uh, email accounts are Gmail accounts, just so everybody knows. 
Oh, so your regular email, your edu. Your Sonoma.edu account is a Gmail account. Oh. It's still Gmail? Yeah. yeah. And so that. So that means that everything you're doing in terms of email on that account can be traced through Gmail? Well, somebody just said their Outlook account, but... But we still use the Google Yeah, Docs. I'm under the impression that it's a Gmail, because when I go on Google, like, it's my Gmail top Sonoma email. Right, it's the Seawolf top Sonoma. Oh, so yeah. how is Gmail protecting us from that or from email? Uh, that, you'd have to ask Gmail. Yeah, I wonder. No, hopefully it's not like Yahoo with all their leaks of email addresses. <laughs> I'm going to go down the middle. What's that? Only is that open to people or is it just you? Well, it, it's open to webmasters. People that monitor websites and sign up with Google Analytics, you can go in and tag. You tag your pages, and the e-commerce software that we use sends the tag when they're making their purchase as well. So we use... It's easier to use those statistics than our own because our server is off, I believe. Uh, Google's are more realistic, more down to the, the detail. But we can see like a user that turned from a hard goods or DVD purchase to video on demand in Google Analytics. But in, on, in the real world for us, the DVD system and the video on demand system are two separate They're entities. So I can't merge the data on my side. So we, that's why we use Google, because they can do it all for us. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. They have full courses that you can go to and learn how to read your analytics and set it all up. And, and the adult industry, the, any show you go to, there's at least four seminars on Google <laughs> Analytics on how to use it to your advantage, how to target market your customers, because we can also pull if they're, we use a thing called geo, uh, geo targeting, geo IP targeting for dollars. Uh, or the pricing of products. So in Eastern, Eastern Europe, we want the product to be about the same cost as it is here or in the UK so that there's no, like when the dollar was really low value, UK was buying stuff in US dollars because it was really cheap. Well, we have control over that now. So we can adjust the pricing based on where they are surfing. So if they come onto the US-based website, we can jack up all of our prices so they stay the same to them. So the Amazon does it too. Amazon's really bad. They do it based on your credit history. So if you have an account with them and your credit is really bad or you don't make as much money, your prices actually might be lower than somebody that's in another tax bracket. I've seen it. I've actually seen that firsthand. Thought it was funny that I could buy something for 50 bucks and a friend of mine who's it's at 105 and I was like but look, on my phone, it's only 50 here, let's buy it here. <laughs> it's like, and it was the same thing. We were looking at the same product on the same website. It was just that he was logged in versus I was logged in. So there was a question on this side. Was it, did you have one? Somebody in the back. How do you feel about pirating? I hate it because it takes away from the bottom line. I hate uh, tube sites. Although, now that you say that, the, or the pirating piece, tube sites, they're owned by the largest porn companies. They're ripping off, so people in our own industry are ripping off other producers' content and dumping it into their own tube sites until they get a cease and desist, driving traffic to their own stuff and trying to convert it into dollars. It's a big problem. It, mainstream Hollywood's having the same, same problem. But they did shut down a big torrent website, Kick Ass. I don't know if anybody's used it, hopefully not. But. But Kick Ass is a torrent site that was shut down globally, and all their mirror sites and their um, oh, what are they called? Their gateways were all turned off recently. Go ahead. Do you see a lot of like so probably our age <coughs> group paying for porn? Because I feel like that's not very common. Uh, n no, I don't. I actually don't see a lot of your age group experimenting with toys as much either. It's starting to pick up. It's more maybe as it perks, maybe it's going to be a little bit later in life for your generation. Uh, mine, it was like, oh, we're out of high school, you know, going into the sex shop. Oh, look at the dildo. Let's try some lube. Let's try poppers, whippets, you know, get into all the fun stuff. If you don't know, poppers are an, a sniffer it's supposed to uh, enhance your sexual experience, and whippets are the, the same stuff that's in whipped cream bottles, you know, mm -hmm. suck it, get high. 
So would you say you make more money off like toys or like selling? Um, I make more. Most of our money right now is on DVDs. Okay. So uh, about seventy-five percent of our income is uh, DVD physical goods, and then uh, video on demand's picking up a lot. Uh, hotel rentals is where hotels are interesting though because you have to go in and, and do like a soft core version of the video. You have to cut it down. You can't show any penetration. And you can't show the actual cum shot, but you can show what happens afterwards. It's, it's strange. You can show the motions, but you can't show the cock going in any orifice. So it's, it's a little bit different. But they still, it makes a lot of money. I know we're so new teams. You said like you wanted to get out of the industry. Like, do you have your reservations about like when you have kids, like telling them like what you did most of your life? Uh, n no, I'd probably be a lot like my parents and tell them what I'd be pretty upfront because if they're, first of all, if we have kids, it's going to be two gay dads, uh, you know, one in Runner Park probably. Uh, two, I I'd want them to know because they're going to have to have a hard shell. Especially if it got out in school, you know, oh, your dad's a gay porn producer. However, I could see kids being really mean. So, but uh, I prepare them for it. So you will get answered. And it's, I'd have to. And even, even later, I mean, not doing it anymore, my name's still going to be linked with a whole bunch of companies. It's not something I can just turn off overnight. So, hopefully, by the time they hit elementary school, <laughs> there's a little bit more of a cushion of. of how much they're going to be tormented, but uh, no, I'd be right alongside of them. Screw them. If if they're going to be picked on, it's the education of the other kid not knowing really what's going on. That, that's the problem, and that's down to the parents need to be educated. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen. People live in closets. I mean, look at what's going on with our election. It's crazy. He's so racist. Uh, you know, there's there's racism, there's sexism, all this stuff's going on, and. Nobody's really shutting them down, and it's like, okay, you know, we get shut down for doing porn, and they're letting this guy go around and just be a racist pig, and nobody media sensationalizes it all. It's, it'll be interesting, scary, but interesting. Any more questions? You look like you have one. No. I have a question. Yeah, don't you? No. <laughs> uh, how many how many DVDs are you putting out a month? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, they've slowed down. So we used to do about 200 new titles a month, and we're doing about 85 right now. And it's mainly because people are going more digital. The producers are going more digital. I mean, it's still considered a DVD, or I mean, it's still oh, digital still meaning it's off, a movie, yeah. Uh, yeah, the streaming format versus a hard, good format. Go ahead. Do you guys consider like switching to some kind of streaming uh, we, commerce? We do both. Oh, pretty, pretty, yeah. Um, he was asking if we're thinking about switching to a streaming format versus a DVD format. And right now we do both. You can watch it online. And we find, excuse me, at least with the older customer in the mid 40s to 60s, they'll watch a clip of it online and then they turn around and just buy the disc because they want to own it. It's, it's there. And if they find an actor that they like, they'll just go through and buy everything. Our average ticket item on, on DVDs is about $500 in order. And they're at, the discs sell for 20 to, 20 to $40 a piece. So they'll, they'll order like 20 units at a time. Go ahead. Uh, with your online website, have you ever any issue with copyright? Like other people, like, you know, watching or like, you know, of course, they'll be uh, downloading and then uploading to free sites. Yes. Uh, so he's asking if we've had piracy issues of people downloading from our VOD website onto or another like tube site or whatever. We have a technology that I just love and it was worth every penny that we paid for it. Our video files are not encoded until the user starts watching the video. And when they're encoded, we put all the information of that user in there so that when that file gets uploaded to a tube site, we know exactly who did it and we go right after them. So we give them two tries, and after the second try, it's, it's done. We just have our lawyers go after them, send a cease and desist, and usually it stops right away. If it's a bigger group, we get in. We have a, a organization within the porn industry called Porn Guardian that goes out and looks for clips for us, and they have a technology that uses, we use a, it's a digital footprint. So when we're encoding the video, we're putting our footprint on it, 
they have software that goes to all these tube sites and all these different places and it watches the videos and looks for our footprint and then we get a list of every week, hey, we found this video over here. And they'll pull it down, give us a serial number, and we can cross-reference it with our database and see who it was. And then we'll shut their user account down. Because sometimes it could be a, a password leak, and then all of a sudden everybody's using that one account, and we usually see the download spike. So for the system, we'll shut them down immediately until we can review. Go ahead. I don't know if you really want to answer, answer this, but what do, what do the margins look like? This, this kind of business? On, on which side? On, on all of it? Yeah. Um, well, if, if there is a DVD that I have to purchase and resell, okay. like, it's like about a 200% margin. It's what? 200% margin, margin okay. on DVD markup. So we're, we're marking it up about 200%. Mm -hmm. Lubricant is the only thing that I, is hard to mark up because they've gotten lube into like CVS and Walmart and and those guys are like, just, yeah, they've, they've really brought the price down. So I don't even compete on Lube. I don't even try to sell. We have it all listed. Yeah. So if they want to you know, grab a bottle while they're getting their porn, sure. But you can go to CVS, and that's my cost. So it's, it's, not, it's not worth it. Toys? Depends on the toy. I don't have any with me. These sell for $89. My cost is 69 So I make 20 bucks. Um, but there's knockoff versions and other cheaper things where you can pay like 10 bucks and they sell them for 80. So somebody's going to buy that, they're going to buy something. Right. So I think maybe what he was after, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, was he was, I think he was thinking, okay, uh, you, you did $3 million, uh, oh, then you had a gross million. amount left, and then <laughs> your percentage before you have to pay taxes, if you want to share that. Well, I'd be in video tape now, so, you know. Uh, no, um, I always report a loss. Uh, no, we've, we've made profit, but our, the loss part, you know, if, if you were to see my tax returns, we always, there's so much business expense that it balances out. Yeah, I'm, I'm just an econ so it's like what, total costs and total. Everything. Yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't work it out that way. I bought a nice house. So. It pays all my <laughs> bills. <laughs> I'm comfortable. I mean, I'm, I don't go out and, like some of the porn producers go buy new cars every year. I'm not, I'm not that, I'm more conservative when it comes to spending money, but. Yeah, I just wonder what the margins look like in this kind of industry. Yeah. There. There's a huge margins in some products, and most of them, there's a really big margin, but uh, and then like the name brand stuff, there's, there's little. Well, maybe you can give him a contrast. Tell them what you used to get for a DVD 15 years ago, oh. as opposed to what you get today. So a VHS tape, when they were out there, <coughs> we would sell for $99 for about an hour's worth of footage on the gay side. Um, and that was the, just plain old straight rip, you know, no flare, no box, no, no story. And that's no. not adjusted for inflation or anything like that. No, that's, that's not that's just adjusted just for inflation. It, the, the gay porn side, you have, it, if you look at the statistics of a gay couple, if there are two guys in the relationship, they have a double income, they have a lot more money just to give away. So the, uh, then, that was then, this is now, the price has dropped con considerably, considerably. If you take that same VHS and move it to a DVD, um, new releases are about 40 bucks. Old stuff you can get for probably five bucks. So it's a little, little back, I mean, it's changed a lot. So the VHS that you got $99 for, what would that have cost? Oh, it cost us to make yeah, what, what would it cost the same. You? Huh? The same. It cost the same. It would cost the same for us to produce that back then than it, it would. It cost us the same amount to produce the same video now if we did it back then. No, no, no. So, increasing the so like if it was a five C video, let's say we paid two hundred and fifty dollars per person per scene. I mean, we're we're amateur. We do amateur. We don't do high budget films. So if there's ten guys in it, we're not in five. $2,500 to produce the DVD, just paying the models, or the, the VHS. Editing, a couple hundred bucks, mastering. So you're looking about three grand to produce it. And it, that would be the same for today. And the DVD. revenue that, would, that three grand would yeah. produce would be what? In uh, 15 years ago. 15 years ago? Oh God, uh, about 100,000. <laughs> oh yeah, that was when VOD was just hitting the market and we'd sell, we'd sell like, 
1,500 copies of that VHS. And then when DVD hit, oh my God, DVD was awesome. 30 cents retail ready packet. These cost 15 to 30 cents a piece to manufacture. One sell your others. So you can see the markup. It's, yeah, if you're shooting your own stuff, I, okay, so this particular video probably costs four grand, and then you pay the actors and everything else. Yeah. This one is 15 years old, and they're still selling it for $30, $39.95. And I'm selling at least 100 units a month of, the, of this particular video. So, do you have the recent, uh, I mean, no one knows, as we all know, but do you have the latest guesstimation of what global porn dollars are? What they're oh, I, I have no idea. I stopped doing that because there's so many different sources. And, and when you go to an industry event, everybody's beasting about how much they make. You don't know exactly. Last thing I heard, and again, no one knows, because no one, I mean, there's so many sidebars to how to make it on porno. But it was approaching 100 billion yeah. was the guesstimation. And that was coming from the credit card companies, including video on demand and hotels. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys ever look at like Hilton's bottom line statements or you know their their uh, revenue statements, video on demand is a huge line item in their hotel rooms. And it most of that was soft porn. Yeah, soft porn porn. And AT and T used to make tons of money off of 900 numbers, and they just bury it in the in the bottom line in their revenues, lots of money. It's a fun industry. I, I, the, I think the best part about it, being a techie, is seeing all the gadgets. Because the annual show usually takes place at the same time as CES in Vegas. And we'll go for a week and spend four days at the tech show looking at what's new, what's coming out, and all these fun you know, VR. We did that five years ago. Uh, there's the new interactive, like full body models that you can like possess across the internet and have interactions with somebody else across the world. You wear a suit. It's a virtual reality. It's a virtual reality. So thing. you put a you, no, you put a whole suit on a sensation suit, and the person on the other side can do the same thing, and then you get in a room, a VR room, and you interact in a room. Online. And it's, there's actually a sensation that will come through this. Yeah, if you touch some part of your body. Yep. They they feel it. It's not true, but it, it's that that's what's happening. Is there some pretty? It's fascinating. I, I, I could see many uses for it besides porn as well. But I just it's fascinating to see us drive that technology as, as an industry. Well, that should help long distance relationships, guys. Right. <laughs> You've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend going to Rutgers, and you're here. Why well, you can still hook up? <laughs> Did you talk at all about what the some of the conventions are like? Uh, just the one about the drugs. Uh, <laughs> the conventions are pretty overwhelming. Uh, I we do two. We do the Vegas show, which is mainly consumer based now. That's why we end up at CES most of the time because all the fun gadgets are over there, but. When you go to the big shows, they have all the actors there, and they're, it's like, now it's at the Hard Rock Cafe in Vegas, and that place is full of fans wanting to see their porn stars, and they'll have pictures of them, they'll have their DVDs. They is this during the big awards they do yeah, every year? Yeah, the ABN awards. Yeah. Um, but it, see, we're on the gay side of the industry, so we go to the gay VNs in LA for the awards. We don't even, we don't even go to the, the big ones. Well, so the one in Las Vegas doesn't deal, is just strictly heterosexual? They don't deal with gay at all? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of discrimination in our really? industry. Oh, yeah. Even even based on race. I mean, look at all the gay porn. It's all white boys. There's no, there's, I mean, it's very rare. Do you see Asian? Or do you see blacks? Do you see, uh, there's a lot of uh, discrimination within our own industries on body shaming. And, Unbelievable. And, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting. That's why there's so many little genres in the gay side. That's, you got your bears, the bigger guys. Those guys you won't see in a jock video because they're not jockey, they're not built. And it's, that's this consumer dictating it. It really is. Market drives it. Yeah, the market drives it. So one day when they want their big, black, hairy, fat guys will come out with some big, huge, burly black guys that will do some gay porn. A jelly double. Yeah, jelly double. There you go. <laughs> you, uh, oh, five five minutes? 
We got room for a couple of more guys. Well, we're almost done. No more questions. It's too tired. Go ahead. Um, I don't know how to phrase this, but how do you feel about uh, the differences between porn and prostitution? So she's asking me how I feel about the differences between porn and prostitution. Um, I've never worked in the prostitution industry. So, no, I just say it because it is, it is, it is different. Um, we get slammed a lot with the human trafficking and porn. The, the time that I've been in the industry, I know that there's a lot of models that do escort. I mean, we, there's, there was a huge takedown of a, a website called Rent Boy that was just that. They were prostituting online. Um, but I haven't experienced it. So like, with the models that we use, we're using amateur guys that have not really been in the industry that aren't out there. So I, I, when I first got into the industry, I thought it was the same thing. We're paying the guys to see sex. But now I see it as a business more because there's a lot of legal, there's forms they sign. We do background checks on people. It's not just grab somebody off the street, although that we'd love to. But you know, all of that stuff's <coughs> faked. We have to bring them in the office, take pictures of them with their IDs. I have mounds and mounds, file cabinets full of IDs and release forms just to prove that the person that's in the video cons consented to it. So and we've had the FBI at our office say, hey, we need to see this person. Who is this person? And we pull their file, give them the paperwork, and usually that's it. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know much on the, uh, the prostitution side otherwise. If I could see it side by side, experience it, I guess. Do you see crossover? Do you I, see performers <clears throat> that work as prostitutes? I do. Yeah. I do. Uh, we see a lot of the the guys that really get into the industry that you know wants the money really bad. They'll get over on the prostitution side and and escort. They call it escorting, but I know that there's more going on. I mean, those are the models I wouldn't use because they're open risk for STDs more. And they usually turn into heavy drugs and other stuff too, so we try to stay away. Mm. They could be problems on sets. They get too big in their edge. One more over here by the wall. Oh, that's a good one. What is the best thing that you love about your job? What's the worst? Or like, what do you dislike? I dislike that we don't have air conditioning in our warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I like it. Um, I find our customer base, uh, it, so the gay customer is pretty high, high anxiety. If we can't ship the porn fast enough, they call all the time. So that's one thing that I hate about our business. On the same side, I love our customers. Uh, I find they are more into the porn than I have ever been. They'll tell me every sighting of an actor. I have one guy that's on my speed dial on my phone. If somebody ever asks me if that actor is in another movie and I can't find him in my database, I call this guy, text him, he can tell me every film somebody's been in, and I just find it fascinating. It's like faster than Google. So our, our customers, I've I've built tons of relationships. With, so I like that. Yes. That part. and technology. Technology is fun. Well, all right, Chris. I right, thank you so much.